It's a family reunion. The hiring of Penny Hardaway as head coach in 2018 signaled a new era for Memphis basketball. Penny's Memphis roots, AAU connections, and NBA pedigree all served as talking points, as the media eagerly anticipated his college head coaching debut. Thus far, Penny has led the Tigers to three straight 21 seasons, including an NIT title in the 2020-21 season. A lot of the attention has been directed to his recruiting success, most notably the number one recruiting class in 2019, headlined by James Wiseman. Despite the team's star power, however, it is the team's defense that has led to its success, with the Tigers leading the nation in adjusted defensive rating this past year. In this video, we'll take a look at two of the main reasons for Memphis's defensive success, plus a bonus section at the end where I will highlight a sequence of Penny's in-game coaching adjustments. Thank you for supporting the channel, and please be sure to like and subscribe for more basketball-related breakdowns and analysis. With Memphis, the first thing you'll notice is their four-court pressure. They like to show a man-to-man -man press, which is usually used to slow the ball down and kill clock. In this clip, for example, Boogie Ellis' pressure forces Colorado State to initiate the offense with only 20 seconds left on the shot clock. What makes Memphis different is that they'll trap out of this. Against the man press, what most teams like to do is to clear out the backcourt, maximize space, and let the point guard bring the ball up one-on-one. -on -one. So when Memphis goes to trap, it catches teams off guard, leaving them with no time to space out and help the ball handler alleviate pressure. As Quinones traps off the inbounder against South Florida, his man isn't even looking at the ball, leaving 23 with no choice but to throw it across court, right into Quinones' hands. While these traps may seem random, there are some patterns to be found. A common cue for Memphis players to trap is when the ball handler crosses midcourt. This allows them to use the sideline and half-court line as extra defenders. Another reason to wait until then is because, by that point, the offense has already gotten into its sets already. If players are standing together trying to set screens for one another, that usually means they are not well spaced to give the point guard passing options. The Memphis players will go as well if they see the back of the ball handler's head. With the ball handler completely unaware of their presence, this is almost a guaranteed turnover for the offense. Memphis can switch it up and give different looks too. They are usually less aggressive with the backcourt trapping in their 1-2-2, but will look to trap in the corners again when they fall back into their 2-3 zone. With the 2-3 usually thought of as a more passive, energy-conserving defense, opponents do not expect them to trap out of it, yet again catching teams off guard. In their first game of the AAC tournament against UCF, Memphis used the 2-2-1 press and had success with it as well. The concern with aggressive full court trapping is always what to do when opponents break the trap. Then, the offense is playing with a full head of steam and a numbers advantage. However, with Memphis, the player manning the last line of defense is AAC Freshman of the Year Musa Sise. With a 7-4 wingspan and a 9-4 standing reach, a numbers advantage for the offense doesn't necessarily equal an easy shot, as you see in these clips. While Penny has been applauded for landing some high profile recruits, it's just as commendable the way he was able to find long, athletic guys who fit into his system. By now you might have realized, Memphis will also send traps from right in front of the ball handler. This might seem counterintuitive, as the ball handler can easily see the trap coming. We'll have more on this later. This graph shows the difference between opposing stars' offensive rating in their games against Memphis versus their average offensive rating. A positive number would mean that these players played above their usual level against Memphis, whereas a negative number suggests that these players struggled in that game. As you can see, Memphis was pretty good at equalizing their opponent's leading scorers. The only two games in which the opponent's leading scorer played up to their level were two 30-point blowouts against Central Arkansas and Mississippi Valley State. So how does Memphis do this? Well, for one, they practically face guard opposing stars as soon as they cross half court. On this play, Quinones is the only Memphis player outside the three-point line and provides zero help as Wichita State gets middle on the handoff. This denial makes the opposing best player have to work hard for every catch and disrupts the timing of a lot of sets. Throughout the course of the game, this coverage will also wear down and fatigue opposing stars quicker than they're used to. Memphis will adjust their ball screen coverages for the best player too. If it is an opposing star running the ball screen, they will trap. 
The idea is to get the ball out of the best player's hands and make everyone else beat them instead. If the person running the ball screen isn't the opponent's best player, then Memphis will usually drop instead and adopt a more conservative coverage as we see in these clips. On this play, not only does Cisse come out to Quinton Grimes as he comes off the screen, but Quinones' nail help basically turns this into a triple team, again demonstrating Memphis' intention of making someone else other than the best player beat them. We mentioned earlier how Memphis will send traps from right within the ball handler's line of vision. While this may not be conducive to turning a team over, it does, again, force the ball out of the best player's hands. Similar to their traps in the full court, Memphis's length and athleticism empowers them to go to such extremes as they are able to scramble and recover better than most teams. So imagine yourself as the best player on the other team. Not only do you have to help your team beat the press in the backcourt, but once you do, you have to get open against someone who is face guarding you. Then, when you do get the ball, you get doubled almost immediately, so you have to give the ball up and start over again. I hope this graph is starting to make more sense now. When Memphis played Tulane in mid-December, we saw Penny make yet another adjustment to stop their opponent's leading scorer. With Quinones face guarding Jalen Forbes, a 16.4 point per game scorer, Memphis jumped out to a huge lead early. However, led by tough shot making by Gabe Watson, who was only averaging 3 points per game at the time, Tulane hung around and made it a one possession game going into halftime. After a couple more Watson buckets early in the second, bringing his total on the night to 16, Penny had, had enough. With Tulane at the line, you can see him mouthing instructions to the team. We find out what those adjustments are on the ensuing defensive possession, as Memphis sets up in a box and one, with Damian Ball chasing Watson around the court. They get the stop against the disoriented Tulane offense, and as Memphis turns the ball over on the other end, we head into a timeout, bringing another stoppage of play and allowing Tulane to draw something up. They come back and take advantage of the fact that Memphis was not going to leave Watson, using him to screen the zone and open up a wide open three. Even though the shot didn't fall, it was still an open look on a good play call by coach Ron Hunter. As Memphis gets fouled on the other end and line up for free throws, we can see Jeffries talking to Penny about that play, and Penny telling their players to switch it next time. Sure enough, Tulane tries the same thing again, and the switch prevents another open three. A fun example of coaches making in-game adjustments on the fly. Thank you for watching the video. Please like and subscribe and leave any ideas and suggestions in the comment section down below. Thank you.